This message was recorded at the Billy Graham Training Center at The Cove in Asheville, North Carolina. Through the ministry of The Cove, we're training people in God's Word to win others to Christ. It's our goal to develop Christians who experience God through knowing Him better, knowing His Word, building godly relationships, and helping others know Him. We trust that this message will strengthen your walk with God and help you experience Him right where you are. Well, folks, great to be with you. Maybe you see me look like I'm hobbling around a little bit. That's because I'm hobbling around a little bit. Um, I did something to my knee a few weeks ago. I have no idea what I did. Of course, I can't find out because they won't let me come to the orthopedic specialist for um, another month. So it's been 16, it's been 10 weeks. But I appreciate your prayers. That's why the chairs are up here. I might have to just sit down once in a while. Um, but hopefully everything will be okay. Oh, one update. Our grandchildren. What number did you say, Ron? No, it's okay. What time? What? 11. 11. Okay. We've got 16 grandchildren. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of multiplication in our family. And three of our ladies, two daughters and one daughter-in-law, have had four of four each, so that's sixteen. <laughs> that's sixteen of them, and uh, so it's a L. Oh, let me tell you the second surprise: they all live in Lynchburg. <laughs> now try to figure that out. I mean, Lynchburg's not as small a town as you might think. I don't know if we have like two hundred thousand or something, but to have them all in the area, that's that's quite nice. And so. Um, Mom, that's my wife over there, Eileen, and she gets a lot of calls when she's out because everybody wants her advice in the family, so (laughs) things are happening. Do pray for her. They've got a very close friend of the family who is dying tonight, and they were uh, taking him away. They thought they were just before she came up here, and he hasn't passed away yet. His name is Dick. I'm sure he wouldn't mind us saying that, but please pray for him. He's Christian, and uh, it's a really, really rough weekend for his family. Well, I'm looking forward to this a whole lot, and um, let me tell you why. Uh, This is my third time here uh, lecturing, and the last time it was on the resurrection, which I do most of my research and writing and debating and so on, on, and there were about, as nearly as we can remember, there were about 65 people here. And um, that's not bad for the summertime. But this time, as we got closer and closer to the date, we found out that, that this group is about two and a half times larger than the group that came for the resurrection. Now, let me tell you why that's really special. The resurrection is only the center of our faith. So if that many people want to hear the resurrection, you're not surprised because there's a lot of information that most people have no knowledge of. As a matter of fact, I'm in the middle of a a four-book contract on the resurrection, and manuscript pages, they number 6,000 pages on the resurrection. There's a lot of information. So I expect people would want to come to hear about the resurrection. But when I hear two and a half times that are here to speak about doubt, I think Wow, if the Lord does that, I hope this is going to be the beginning of a cure either for, I mean, I won't embarrass anybody but looking for a show of hands, but I'm guessing quite a percentage of the number here are either here because you've gone through doubt before, and when I give you a definition, it's going to include almost all Christians, so um, either you have and or you're helping somebody else through and or you say, not right now, but I know I will be soon. Because that's just the way the world is. And that's just the way life is. That's just the way the world is today. The whole world, everything in it. The, the, the plane, you know, being late today and not pulling the thing out of the, you know, not, not just being ready for people to even go out there to the tarmac. It's just, you know, It's hard. And these are hard times. And so I'm sure you ask a lot of questions. There are three major kinds of doubt. I'll I'll define all these in just a few moments. And you folks have the notes. I'll define them all 
in a few moments. But we've chosen the one, since it's a short meeting, uh, just three weeks, uh, three nights. Oh, and they said I could stay till 12 o'clock midnight tonight if I just let you, <laughs> if I let you go by midnight. But um, there's enough material on doubt, heady stuff, as well as real simple things, that I just finished teaching a PhD course on doubt two months ago. Then I have this session, and in January, Lord willing, I have to go to another school, New Orleans Theological, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and teach another PhD course on doubt. Now, why would three courses like this be offered in pretty quick succession, all of them in about a half a year? Because that's just an example of how many people are hurting. And the reason I'm, th I'm thrilled to be here with you is the opportunity to see, or maybe hear, examples of people's burdens really, really being lifted. And let me give you a, a word of hope. Um, you can be healed from doubt. Not, it's not actually that difficult. But we picked emotional doubt out of the three because emotional doubt is by far the most common. It is by far the most painful. And it is by far the least likely to hurt you. Now, what a series of comments. Most common, okay, I get that. Most painful, yeah, there's gonna be some people sitting here going, yeah, you better believe it, it hurts. It hurts bad, it hurts badly. But it's least likely to do any damage. That's strange. What I'm kind of getting at is that we bring most of it on ourselves. And so we'll tell you about that and how you know that and how you can get away from that. How, 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 how can I say that? Uh, how, did, how each of us can think more about how to stop us from hurting us. That's kind of what emotional doubt is. And I'll mix it in with some, I'm not a psychologist um, at all or a counselor. I have a little diploma in rational and motor behavior therapy, which is, I'm, it doesn't make me anything. It makes me dangerous. <laughs> uh, I'm not a counselor. But I have taught this material at the PhD level for a clinical counseling program for 10 years. Not because I'm good or not because I'm a counselor, just because everyone's hurting. So we were praying in the, in the back room before we came out here. And my prayer was one I'm very, very sincere about. I tried to pray this prayer any time I go out before a university audience, especially if it's a really uh, an awesome audience that, that um, looks like they're going to be very difficult. I'm often sponsored anymore at universities. I'm co-sponsored by a Christian club on campus and an atheist club on campus. They co-sponsor me. So it's a lot of fun, and you have a lot of people in the crowd who, don't, who wish you never came to campus. Well, this is different. This, these are people who, you folks, who are looking for something that will be applied. So I, I repeat at the beginning, I am not a counselor. I'm not a health care provider. I've taught those people, but because I have a specific expertise in what's called philosophy of psychology, but not because I'm a psychologist. So just those uh, disclaimers up front. Let me start with a little bit of a personal testimony. On top of everything else I've told you, I'm also a veteran doubter, a very veteran doubter. You go, what's a very veteran doubter look like? Well, I, I was a doubter for 10 straight years where it was the most dominating thing in my life, and the second 10 years where it was like maybe second or third place in my life, the most important thing. So 20 years, off and on, of doubting, and I, if this is you, uh, be aware of this prayer or comment, but I would say to the Lord, if you will get me past this, I'll be the best little whatever, minister of some sort, pastor, counselor, I'll go into counseling, I'll do whatever you want, just get me past it and I'll do it. But here's the key, I never got past it. And so therefore I wasn't serving. I wasn't serving because I wasn't doing, I wasn't fixing this thing up. 
second thing is my doubt was bookended by two deaths of the two most important people in my life up till that time. The two most important people. The serious part of my, my uh, doubt started with the death of my great-grandmother. And you might say, great-grandmother, most important person in your life? You betcha, my mom knew it, my dad knew it, and they were very happy that she was because they loved her. And they were so happy that when we went over there, I spent 100% of my time with her in her bedroom. She died when I was eight. My doubt started a few years later. And then in, um, well, after the two rounds of doubt went by, the mother of my four children, and we've been married for 23 years and she was only 43 years old, died of stomach cancer. And, and I realized that how, how death and life are hooked up and how death and doubt are hooked up. These are prominent things. Now, she died in 1995. Eileen was a friend of our families. And we went to the same church. Uh, you may have heard of it, Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg. And uh, we got married. And I told her I was going to say this tonight. We saw Will up there. Will is a graduate of Liberty University, as you may know. Will was a youth pastor at Eileen's church. And we got married in the church that Will was the youth pastor for. So we came last year, we saw him at the table there, and we ribbed him a little bit and teased him. I'm sad we'll miss him tonight, but, but we've got that connection too. So, all right, enough by way of intro here. By the way, we've been married for 27 years. So that makes 50, 27 and 23. That's not bad. I don't know if either one of us thought we'd get to 27, but uh, here we are, and both doing fine by, by God's grace. But notice doubt has figured in every inch of my life, and talk about pain, I'm a veteran of doubt pain. And other people, I had a lady sitting across the desk from me one time, came in to talk to me about doubt, and she said, it was definitely emotional doubt. And with this, I'll start as soon as I tell this. It's very brief. She said, if you could take my doubt away from me, you can have my right arm. You can cut it off. And I laughed and I said, yeah, it's really painful, isn't it? And she said, no, I am dead serious. I would give my right arm literally to stop this pain. And I've always remembered that one liner that she would give up her right arm, let it be excised, to, if she could stop this kind of worrying. So we um, tried to, to deal with it. All right, let me go on to this. I've told you there's three kinds of doubts all right here. Tonight is just an intro, because there's, I mean, for me to be able to teach a PhD course at Liberty on this in June, a PhD course at New Orleans Baptist back to back, you know there's heavy enough things to be in a PhD course but enough people hurting that the Cove plus two universities want this topic taught. That just tells you a little hint about what's going on. There we go. It's religious doubt that we're talking about, and in particular, if you saw your, your um, hmm. Is there a reason this is not changing real fast? No? Oh, it's a little slow. All right, let's start with the definition. Now, you folks have this in your notes. I'm glad you do, because that means that's less things you have to write down if you're interested in taking notes. A brief definition. You know, doubt may be the most common problem for Christians. Of all the Christians in the world, it may be the most common problem there is. And you go, well, I don't know about that. A lot of people claim that. What about pride? What about this? Well, there's a lot of people who are now proud, right? But how many people do you know that have never doubted? Especially with this definition. I think the key synonym is the word uncertainty. <clears throat> uncertainty regarding God or our relationship to him. Uncertainty regarding God or our relationship to him. I mean, I don't want to embarrass anybody and say how many of you are here because you're doubters, but I could do it this way. 
Uh, how many of you have here who, ha- uh, let's go ahead and do it. This, is gonna, this isn't negative at all. How many of you here have never doubted before? You've never asked questions about God or your relationship to him. How many of you have ever doubted? Was that up or down or half? Sorry? I misunderstood you. Okay. You're a doubter. Okay. I heard one person in a church. He was a very well-known author. He came to Thomas Road years ago. And he said, I've never doubted before. I knew him really well. So I made a personal note of that. And I said, I'm going to ask him. And after it was over, I said, you've never doubted? He goes, oh, no, no. You really misunderstood me. What I meant in context was, I never doubt God's existence. If you mean things like why God doesn't answer my prayers or what about my salvation, he goes, man, I doubt all the time. (laughs) Okay, well, that eliminates him from the list. (laughs) I've spoken on this topic many, 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 many times over a lot of years, and I've had one person tell me they never doubted. And I... I may believe her, but the first thing I did was I turned to her husband who was standing right there, and I said, have you ever heard her ask a question about God or her relationship to him? And he said, he's a minister. He said, I really have never heard that from her. So until, and I haven't kept, I haven't seen them for a long, long time, but maybe there's somebody out there but just that you didn't raise your hands here, that's, this is an issue. You know, any uncertainty regarding God or our relationship to him. I have two fellows, both with PhDs, and a third one who's a pastor, and I give them all my doubt referrals. I used to handle them myself, but they took so much time because emotional doubters will hang on and hang on and hang on, and if you'll do everything they want, I, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. You won't get anything else done. Especially if you have four or five of them. So I start passing them off to these two guys who have a doubt ministry. In fact, if you're interested, if you're working with somebody who's doubting and you want to know somebody will help you, let me give you the name of a, a group with these two PhDs. The name of the group is Core Apologetics. And if you need me, I'll give you the whole... I can get you the whole... Um, address for in email but the group is core if you put core apologetics in you might get the rest of the of the email address but i think he spells a capital o-r-e but you know on the computer you don't need to do that but he lives in arkansas and his co-author lives in in england in um virginia i don't know why i said that in uh, virginia and talk about you fellas maybe some of you wives um anybody uh, to show you what kind of people often get involved in doubt, uh, the guy who founded this ministry is a pistol instructor for the National Rifle Association. The other guy is a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And the one who's a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, his wife is about 5'4", weighs 115 pounds, and he said, I usually cannot tap her out when we wrestle. So he walks around the house, it's a true story. He walks around the house and he pokes her in the ribs. He goes, you wanna go? You wanna go? And like one time she said, not now I'm making peanut butter sandwiches for the kids. They have three little ones. But sometimes they do, and uh, that's another story. Okay, uncertainty. Uncertainty regarding God, obviously. Okay, common examples. These aren't types of doubt, but they're the kinds of questions that are taught, or asked. Is Christianity true? I think that one's fading into the background. Years ago, it might have been the most common one. Is Christianity true? Why don't I have assurance? Extremely common. How do I, another way to ask it, how come I don't know if I'm saved? I beg, 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 God to show me I am. Man, and he's, this is one of those 
people that will say, I'll be the best pastor, the best singer, the best whatever. I just have to get my own salvation straightened out. And then they get, as time goes on, they get angry at God for not letting them get their salvation straightened out. Why do bad things happen to good people? By the way, there's a book down there somewhere, wherever the bookstore is. Um, a psychologist with two PhDs and I wrote a book years ago called What's Good About Feeling Bad? And it's down there. Some other ones are too. I brought four total books. Oh, by the way, the other two of the three books, on, I've written three books on doubt. Two of the three books on doubt are available for free on my website, GaryHabermas.com. It's up on the left-hand side under the Books tab. And uh, two of those books are there. They're not the best typing, but uh, one of them is called Dealing with Doubt. It's the most theoretical of my books on doubt. And the second one, there are only like five of these down there. It's all I had. I, when they asked me to bring books, I just didn't have time to order. But it's called The Thomas Factor, and you might think that's about the resurrection. But remember, doubting Thomas. It's called The Thomas Factor, and the co-author is, I'm sorry, the subtitle is Using Your Doubts to Draw Closer to God. And there's a book there on my, my uh, I refuse to say first and second wife, but my, the, my children's mother who died, there's a book down there because death and dying is very close to doubt. They're all tied together. That's all, they're down there, but you can get two of the four free for free on my website. The Thomas Factor one and the Dealing with Doubt one. Okay, and lastly, why, how should I handle God's silence, such as his being silent? How come my prayers are never answered? I know so-and-so, and he or she always has their prayers answered, almost always. I know them real well, and I never get my prayers answered. What's my problem? Could it be because I'm not saved? These are very common examples of um, questions that are raised. But these are the families, I think, that doubt fits into most clearly. The first one is the simplest kind of doubt. It might take the headiest kind of people, but it's the simplest kind of doubt. Factual or philosophical doubt. Uh, show me God exists. How many good arguments are there? Yep, you've given me three. I'd like about three more. I'm, I'm really into this. Uh, what do you have? What about the problem of evil? Why is God not a... I mean, wh why do many things happen about to unbelievers as happen to believers? Emotional doubt and volitional doubt follow. But the factual doubt... Well, I'll tell you a second how you know these three apart. Emotional doubt's the one we're doing tonight. I have a few things to say about factual doubt because that's because I assume some of you are going to come up against it, but we're going to leave that subject really soon. Probably first thing tomorrow morning, we'll be done with factual doubt. Lord willing. Philosophical doubt, same thing. Same, those hardest questions. And the second kind, and why do I do them in this order? Because factual or philosophical doubt that is not answered... This is a nasty word, but doubt that is not answered festers, and it gets infected. Doubt that is not answered gets infected. And so factual doubt very easily moves to emotional doubt. And the doubter makes a move something like this. Great, you want to answer my prayers? I don't know why I should be having devotions today. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to have them. And two weeks later, I think I'll skip worship. I mean, if he doesn't care, I don't care. And, and it gets kind of, uh, it can be kind of nasty. But factual questions, unanswered, lead to, often lead, very often lead to emotional doubt. I've already said it's the most common. From what we can tell, Ron, the fellow, Ron Davis, the fellow who founded Core Apologetics, PhD, did a dissertation in this area. I think he said that in his study, emotional doubters account for about 80% of all doubters. And the rest are divided up between one and three. Factual, and I'll get to volitional here in a minute. So emotional doubters, they think God doesn't have the best interest in mind, uh, maybe because they're not believers in the first place. 
So they've got to worry about their, oh, here's, here's a real winner. Get, you get this one a lot. So here's my problem. I just told you about it. Did I commit the unpardonable sin? I, you know, it'd be neat if all of you, there's no non-doubters among you. It'd be neat to take a little survey with nobody's names on them and see how many have asked each of these questions. I'd be interested. That'd be really, you know, how many have ever said, um, I need assurance of my salvation? How many have ever asked the question of, have I committed the unpardonable sin? So that's emotional doubt. Volitional doubt we won't get into unless we have time. There is volitional doubt data in your notes. I didn't do all of it. I've got a few other PowerPoints I could have uh, brought, but this is an non-volitional doubt. Let me tell what volitional doubt is. Volitional doubt is the nastiest kind of doubt. It's the most dangerous. It's the kind that most likely will ruin a life. Oz Guinness, if you know that name, uh, associate of Francis Schaeffer's years ago and a very accomplished Christian apologist, calls vo- what I call volitional doubt. He, what, he, what I call volitional doubt, he says about it, he says, volitional doubt is a time to warn. Well, what do you mean a, a time to warn? If this is your best friend? I mean, if you're the volitional doubter, We'll tell Mark more about this later. But you have to kind of grab yourself by the, your pelts and say, when are you going to grow up and talk to yourself? Because counselors will tell you oftentimes the harder you speak to yourself, the more likely it'll work. If you talk like this to yourself, you know, if I were you, I'd want to stop this right now. You could save both of us a lot of trouble. Guess who's not listening? You. But guess who's listening when mom calls you by your middle name? Right? If mom means business, I'm, doing, I'm acting right now. And sometimes we have to speak to ourselves by our middle names. Volitional doubt is doubt that often travels this way. Factual doubts. I don't know why I'm not getting answers. Oh, God doesn't care? And this can be just weeks in between, but it usually, it usually, takes, it usually takes years. I don't want to make any comments that have to be this or that. Someone can move very quickly. Just like sicknesses can move very quickly, and somebody else can have the same sickness and take years. So the person says, oh, you're not going to answer me? Well, I'm, you know, I must not be a Christian. And when you say I must not be a Christian, the blood pressure, however you want to measure it, heartbeat, blood pressure, worry, it starts going through the roof. You know why? Because for many of us, salvation is the thing we want more than anything else in our lives, bar none. And emotional doubters are often convinced that they're not going to get it. That's what I want most, and I can't have it. And the blood pressure heartbeat goes up. You can only live so long in that state of mind And so a lot of people, when they've lived in that state of mind for a long period of time, they get jaded. And they basically say to to God, I've had it. I've had it with you. Do me a favor. Stay in your half of the universe, and I'll stay in my half of the universe. I don't want to hear anymore. I'm done. That's the hardest kind of volitional doubt. Thankfully, a lot of volitional doubters are half emotional and half volitional. See, we're whole people, so we don't only have one kind of doubt. We have mixed. And just like when you go to a, a physician, they have to treat the, the symptom or symptoms that's the most dangerous. And you go, but how about my sore throat? At the very end, and they say, look, if you take care of these two things, the sore throat will take care of itself. I'm dealing with the most important things. And just like that, you have to deal with emotion. You have to deal with all doubters, but you really have to deal with the volitional doubters by bringing the big guns out first. And if you're a good friend of the volitional doubter, you're probably the person who should do the talking. And you go, not me. I hate this kind of stuff. That person will get mad. They'll call me names. I, 
I know that shouldn't bother me, but it does. I don't like this. No, I'm, I'm not going to do it. But who's going to talk to the volitional daughter if you don't I'll tell you an honest story? An honest story, I hope it's honest. Um, a real, a true story. I know of a pastor who went to a fellow's house to try to witness to him in this state, volitional, and the guy was kind of one of these man's man kind of outdoors, hunting, fishing, football, everything, everything to play. And the pastor kept telling him, you know, you're, you're living in sin and so on and so on, and you really need to stop this. And, and the fella got sick of it. And he told the pastor, you leave right now or I'm going to throw you out my front door. And I'm not kidding around. And the pastor got up and left. But the pastor kept coming over. And finally, this person became a Christian. And what's really cool is, if you came into his hunting, fishing, buy your rifles here store, if you came in, he would be open at 4 o'clock in the morning for the early risers, the fishermen, hunters, and so on. He'd have the coffee already out. And if you came through his front door after he came to the Lord, if you came through his front door, you would not leave without hearing the gospel. He told everybody. And the first time I met him, he was going strong in the church or the pastor that he was going to throw out the door. And he said, hey, uh, you know, I'm a guide on this big river out here. And uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. While you're in town, if you'll go fishing, my boat, my gas, my truck, everything, I'll put you out there, I'll put you on the bass. All I want to do is ask you apologetic questions all day long. Deal? <laughs> now, what a change from I'll throw you out of my house if you come one more time. I check on this guy regularly, and I hear, I hear for a long time over and over that he's doing, he's doing quite well. Because see, oftentimes any of these people can go back. All right. All right, here's how you know the differences. Factual or philosophical doubt, it's like a broken bone. Broken bones are not nice, but when you set them, or your walking boot or a cast or whatever, they heal. And factual doubt can be very complicated philosophically, historically, but it's not that hard to heal. And the answer to factual doubt is facts. Or emotional doubt is emotional data. I'm sorry, philosophical data. We're going to talk about it just enough to get you into it, but that's not the point of this. Here's how you know what emotional doubt is. What's the difference between factual, emotional doubt and factual doubt? If you think you have one or both, or you're dealing with somebody who has one or both, let me tell you how you tell the difference. Here's the first question to ask. Do you or the person you're talking to, do they have loads of what if questions? It goes like this. What if I'm not saved? Well, did you do this? Did you trust Christ? Did you do this? But... What if I did it, but I lost it? No, you, you don't lose it because it's this, this, and this. But you could be wrong, couldn't you? Well, I could be, but I think I'm reading Scripture properly. All right, get up to go. Oh, can I call you tomorrow? Because emotional doubters don't give up, by and large. They... I had one that when I got at work at 8 o'clock in the morning at Liberty, he was there every morning of the week waiting for me. And I thought, dude, give me a break. I have to be able to open the shop, so to speak, and get my work done. And he make a joke about it because he was embarrassed to be there, but he needed some answers. Emotional doubt 
is identified by what ifs. And here's the number one thing that tells you what if it's emotional doubt. Does it hurt? Factual doubt does not hurt unless it's factual and part emotional. Volitional doubt doesn't hurt because these are the who cares guys. So emotional doubt, if you're in a lot of pain, like the woman who was willing to cut off her right arm, if you're in a lot of pain, that by itself is a telltale sign of this being emotional. Okay, we'll get into all this and do all kinds of things, but these are just getting started. There we go. I'm, I'm learning. It takes a while for these to pop up after you punch them three times. Um, there's probably no subject in theology, philosophy, pastoral, this or that, Christian education, there's almost probably no subject that is accompanied by more misbeliefs than doubt. If you're going to help a doubt or help yourself, you're going to have to change almost everything you believe about doubts. Because what you think you know about them doesn't work. It doesn't work because it's not true about doubts. Here's some doubts. Here's some misbeliefs. It never occurs to biblical heroes, only biblical losers. Really? I mean, we'll look, take a look at some names in a moment here, but what do you think about Job, whose name is synonymous with doubt? What about Abraham? You know, next to Job, Abraham is probably the guy in the Bible who has the most run-ins involving doubt. But guess what? What's his nickname? The man of faith. Whoa. How does that happen? Because persons with doubts can become persons of faith. In other words, they can be healed. All right, third place probably goes to David and the other psalmists. If you've ever read something and you really want to mess up your day, no, I mean, it's in the Bible, so I have to you know, find out a way to work with this. But sometime, read Psalm 44. All the way through the psalm, the psalmist says, see, in a lot of psalms, the psalmist says, it's this and that, and you're not listening, and this and that, yet you are still good, and I'm still the creature, and you're the creator, and I love you, O Lord. And that's how the song ends. Many of them are like that, where they go off, and then they come back. In Psalm 44, the psalmist says, he accuses God of a lot of things. You broke all your treaties with us. You break your promises. You know, those are fighting words for God. I, I don't know how, how you feel about this, but there's two things in life that if I'm going to get mad about something, the two things that make me the angriest, I've played a lot of sports, especially um, hockey and football. And what, what makes me the angriest is when, A, when someone lies, and they know they're lying, but they continue to lie. And I guess, I mean, you'd call that unethical. But so when someone's unethical, and the second one is when someone is illogical. I'm a philosophy professor. So when I say that's a logical fallacy, you can't say that. Well, I just said it. I know, that's why you're making a mistake and you're a loser. Don't get me angry. <laughs> like that. So, uh, when somebody lies, especially when they lie and know it, and secondly, when they break the rules of ethics and think it's totally okay to do that. So, you know, if you say to, if you say to somebody like that, well, look, look at all these people. They do this and they do that, and, they, and then uh, what about Psalm 44? Uh-oh. The psalmist is blaming God with breaking his promises. He's blaming God with being unethical. Okay, now, if you folks know about Elijah and the prophets of Baal, and Elijah says, why don't you call a little louder? Why don't you cut yourself? Why don't you, I don't know, maybe your God is off hunting or he's sleeping, and we laugh at that. 
we laugh at that, uh, as Christians laugh at that, calling out to Baal because, you know, Elijah's naming him. You know what Psalm 44 does? Blames God was sleeping. Just like Elijah did the prophets of Baal. It says, why are you sleeping when there's so much done to be done in this world? But no, you've got to break your promises. You've got to be untrue to your word. You've got to sleep while we're suffering. And he says, awaken before we're wiped out, and the psalm ends. Why do you think that psalm's in scripture? I mean, I wouldn't say it's your normal kind of edifying psalm, but it's edifying in another way. I think the Holy Spirit inspired a lot of passages from people who ask those kind of questions. They're all over in the Psalms. They're all over in Proverbs. They're pretty much all over in Jeremiah and in Lamentations. And how about, again, it's all coming, but how about John the Baptist asking if Jesus is Messiah or should he go follow somebody else? How about that? So, it seldom happens to unbelievers. It often happens to unbelievers. Folks, I deal with a lot of unbelievers who have doubts. They used to be Christians. They've rejected it. Maybe they're atheists now, but they're hurting. Who deals with that? Not their atheist friends, so I get a call. See, I'm not a Christian, but can you help me with this? <laughs> okay. It occurs mainly to intellectual persons. You know, only the most brilliant among us have these kind of doubts. And the response to that is also, eh, not true. I'd say the most common people it happens to are probably people who think with their feelings. Feelings is how they think. I'm not saying that's horrible. You can learn some things that way, but a lot of people don't like it when you do that. But if, you, if, you're, a, if you're an emotional person who thinks with their feelings, that's probably the most common person, not the intellectual. It always produces negative results. Baloney. If all, from this survey here, if all Christians have doubted at some time and they remain Christians... Can doubt make you stronger? Absolutely. Can doubt make you more committed? Absolutely. Can doubt make you love God more? Folks, that and a dozen other things. You change a person around who's a doubter and they often become the, the kind of believer who's ready to go to their death and you're not going to budge them. It's like they're forged in a fire when they come out. It's sin, maybe even the unpardonable sin. Doubt is not sin all the time. Now, I don't know if we'll get here today. This, I mean, this weekend, this is a tough one, so maybe that's why I'm not doing it. But this is a tough one. But if asking tough questions is doubt... And Jesus never sinned. How about let this cup pass from me? Now look, your comeback's going to be, yes, but he said, nevertheless, your will be done. True. But the nevertheless is that he prayed it in the first place. Let the, why was Jesus born? He knew. Do you have, have you heard songs, gospel songs before the man who was born to die? He knew it. He knew it as soon as he knew something, what he was doing. And he predicted his death many times before he died. And critical scholars think he did predict his death and his resurrection. But then he asked, could he have it removed? If Sure, he said, if it's God's will. That's very special to say if it's God's will. But he was bothered enough to pray it. And if that one wasn't enough, what do you do with this one? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Whoops. That is hard. But it came into, did Jesus feel abandoned? 
I think we're not being fair with the text if we don't think he felt abandoned. What do we call that? Emotional doubt. He felt. First in the garden, then on the cross. Crucifixion is arguably the the worst death anybody could undergo. About a year or two ago, I co-authored an article with a medical doctor, an MD, PhD, and my teaching assistant for 11 years, who's the guy with the Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, black belt, and, and um, he did his master's and doctoral dissertations, master, master's thesis, doctoral dissertation of the resurrection. We wrote an article. You can find it um, online. It's on my, um, it should be on my website, GaryHabermas.com, but it is a survey of medical doctors what is the most common view? What, what causes death by crucifixion? What causes it? But when you read the things that cause it, it's really, really nasty. And it's not surprised that Jesus didn't really, let's put it this way, preferred to avoid it. But he did pray God's will. He did. But he also seems to have felt abandoned. Now, I don't think Jesus ever sinned. If you think he didn't sin, there's your ultimate examples that sin, that doubt is not always sin. Jesus himself. You go, well, he wasn't really doubting, he was asking questions. But remember my definition? If you're asking questions about God or your relationship to him, could it be the unpardonable sin? You know, sometimes I wonder about volitional doubt in that regard. But emotional doubt, just, I'm just saying this humanly speaking, okay? Humanly speaking, um, emotional doubters are almost the last ones you have to worry about being unsaved. Now, I know they may never have accepted Christ. I mean, I know they may never have urged over the plan of salvation. Is, I know that. But if you're an emotional doubter or you're dealing with an emotional doubter, you should rejoice in a way because you're least likely to be unsaved. You know why? Think about this. This is another uh, thing about doubt. It backfires. Why are you, I don't mean anybody personally, but why are you an emotional doubter? Why are you an emotional doubter? Because most emotional doubters that I know are really serious about the Lord, they will say, because eternal life, relationship with Jesus, the most important part of my life, and I think I will never have it. You've told me I can have any gift in the world I want except my favorite gift. And so what, what about you? And I guess I don't love him. I've had people sitting across the table saying, I wish you could just convince me that I love him. <laughs> you know how I can convince you that you love him? You're in my office today. Do you always worry about people you hate? Do you always worry about people you don't love? Do you always worry about and only about people you wish would get, get lost? The fact that you're here saying I'll cut off my right arm and other similar things tells me, you know what? I think you're admitting the Lord is sort of important to you. And so many emotional doubters never think about that. It's opposed to belief. It might even be unbelief. It's not. Um, The words for doubt are words that in the Greek, there's about a half dozen of them, the words in the Greek are halfway between doubt and, uh, I mean, belief and unbelief. That's why Os Guinness, his his first book, on this topic, he, he came out a number of times with different uh, titles. And his first title was In Two Minds, colon, The Dilemma of Doubt and How to, how to Correct It. In Two Minds. That's what the Greek word, that's the primary meaning of the Greek word. You're caught between two positions. Now, this wasn't doubt, this was healing. But remember the man who came to Jesus and asked for healing? and said, Lord, I believe. Jesus said, do you believe? Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. 
Jesus didn't say, get lost. You've got some unbelief. He performed the healing. But the guy said, I believe, help my unbelief. Okay, here's a few more. It's relatively rare. I'm telling you, I used to hear that in the 70s and 80s because they didn't know anybody who worked on it. It's not relatively rare. It's probably the most common problem you can have. It's a weakness, and it should be kept to yourself. <laughs> well, great. See if you're going to get an answer. No, I mean, I'm being facetious. God can speak. God, you can pray. God can answer. It could dawn on you what's going on in this passage or that passage. But there's nothing wrong with talking about doubt. We've got to be more open about talking about doubt. It generally follows similar patterns. <clears throat> it's not just the three I already gave. It's that these are always mix and match. I'm a factual doubter with emotional aspects. I'm an emotional doubter with factual aspects. Oh, this is dangerous. Now, when I teach people what these are, you, next question I get, I think I've noticed some volitional aspects in me, and you said it was the worst. I do. I also noticed some emotional aspects in you, or you wouldn't be coming to talk to me today. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> but how can I quit being a volitional doubter and get back to my emotional pain? I'll keep my emotional pain. I'll let the volitional stay in the other half of the universe. Okay, uh, where are we? It's solved by a similar approach. Not really. And on one reason that keeps it from not being solved by a minimal pro approach is because a similar approach because you talk about individuals and people are different. And pills that work on Mary may now not work with Sam. That's just how we are. It's always solved by the evidence. When I first started dealing with doubt in the 70s, this was one of the most common views. Hey, go study apologetics. Apologetics won't do anything with emotional doubt. Let me tell you what happens. A person comes to you. Oh, I see my time's just about up, so I'll be fast. And they come to you and they say, um, why, don't, why don't you help me? Tell me something. How do I know it's true? And so you give a dozen evidences that are true. And let's say it's a guy. Let's pick on the men because they don't ever think they're emotional. This is kind of a lot of fun. They don't, they don't think they're emotional. So you give them factual evidences, and here's how the guys go out of my office. Wow, I didn't think I would solve this thing. Thank you so much, so much, so much. I feel like a hundred bucks. Okay, well, keep practicing. They go out your door. It's a Monday. Tuesday, you see them in class. How are you doing? Oh, I'm about an 80. Wednesday. I'm about a 60. Thursday, I'm about a 40. Monday, they're back in your office. Factual doubts made them feel really good, but didn't solve their problem. Didn't solve the factual deal. It gets worse with age. It doesn't. And one major survey of 2,000 doubters, you know what the most common age group was? Teenage to about 32, 33. Let's say 12 to 32. Most common doubt. And as you get older, they had a number of 80-year-olds and 80-somethings. They had the lowest doubt rate of all. If I remember correctly, 2%. They're more settled. They think they know what's going on. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm at the end of my time, so I'll, t I'll just show you what's, where you got to pick this up. There's, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go right past this. I think you guys probably know this very, very well. I'll tell you what, I'll start here, because some of you are going to say, no, I didn't know that. But <laughs> Job, Abraham, David, and the psalmist, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, and Paul. What do we do with these doubters? I'm gonna, I want to say something, Lord willing, about factual doubt. Just a little, because there will be factual doubters here. And that's what leads to emotional doubt. And then 